Supreme Council of David Lightbringer is now in session. And yeah, we're going to do that every time. And yeah, you're going to be tired of it. So by the time they actually do it on the show, you're going to be like, oh, you're going to be tired of it. So, so by the time David they Lightbringer do guy it on the does show, that you're going to be like, every oh, time. tired of it. He so always has David that time loop when he streams, and it drives me nuts. Okay, there we go. All right. You do have to have a page of your own stream open in order to have the chat displayed up on the live, uh, up on the page. That's why that always happens. So, hey, guys. Hey there, friends. Let's do my little intro. Hi. How you doing? We're here to talk about dragons. Dragons are what brings us together today. <laughs> this is a little mashup for you. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's. I can't stay away. I can't quit y'all. Cannot quit y'all. Uh, that's the truth. I'm busy, so I'm I'm working hard on my uh, seven videos in seven days, which starts next Monday, the week of the dragon, as it were. Um, and they just HBO won't stop putting out new stuff. There's interviews. For you know, there's uh, there's promo videos. There's trailers proper. There's just all kinds of stuff. And I've kind of almost hit the point where I was like, oh, another trailer. I don't care. And uh, and I let a couple stuff go by. Uh, but then I saw this article from Entertainment Weekly, mostly an interview with Miguel Sapochnik, but also with some of the other cast members. And it's all about dragon biology and morphology. And, well, this is the kind of thing that we've got to talk about. And if you watch my channel for House of the Dragon coverage, it's the kind of thing you're going to want to get my opinion on. And so... Here we are. And guys, I'm sorry. I need to blow my nose. I'm so sorry. Uh, let me give you the funky music, like half of it, and then I'll be right back. Uh, I should have done this before I started, but I'm just a little sniffly here. So one second. And we're back. Okay. And by the way, I am working already. Um, I think the new House of the Dragon music is what's been on a couple of the of the trailers. I have already worked on the one that's like I've got that one. Uh, I'm working on it. So more funky Game of Thrones music is coming your way. Um, yes. The last 10 minutes have been a complete disaster. I was washing my hands and I got soap in my eye. So if I'm like blinking a lot, uh, apologies, but there's lots to talk about. I do have notes ready. Um, it's not just that one Entertainment Weekly interview. There was also a little bit from George Martin uh, in a in a um, interview that was originally with the New York Times, um, and then there's a couple other things. So super chat from Sean Downing. Thank you. Finally caught you live. I've watched like 40 hours of your content over the last two weeks. Ah, you're the reason my channel's been spiking. Thanks, Sean. Nah, um, seriously though, uh, thank you. And I didn't call this a Q&A, but feel free to throw House of the Dragon, specifically dragon-related questions at me. Welcome to the Squishers, Tistai. Um, yes, there you go. And uh, we'll be going, th this will be very uh, discussion-provoking things that we'll be talking about today. So feel free to hit me with the questions uh, in the Super Chats as we go, and I'll try, to, I'll try to take those in stream. Thank you, Heart of Winter. Nice to see you. Very cool icon. Um, I'm familiar with that weirwood art. That is by, oh, I forget the artist. I love that one though. I do like to use it. It's literally like a human heart with the tree growing out of it. Uh, so yeah. And I would appreciate it if everyone would be civilized in the chat today. Um, my number one mod, uh, and fiance Minty is not here. She's going to be in and out. She's going to work. Um, so mods, if you could just look out for any, uh, uh, sex bots or, uh, disgruntled people that were looking for the Corliss Valarion video that wandered into this chat accidentally, uh, that, you know, that need the, need the boots. So just look out for them, but we're pretty, it should be, uh, should be good. So first thing I want to do is, uh, dance on the grave of the people out there who <laughs> defend the end of Game of Thrones and want to tell everyone that, ah, oh, that's going to be the same ending as in the books, all caps, all caps. Um, so here's George talking recently to the New York Times. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, well, I'll get to the... Actually, no. I'll, I'll start with that. The different endings since I, since I mentioned that. Um, so it says, As Condal got to work on House of the Dragon, 
he leaned on Martin's expertise a lot, and we've talked about that, the opposite of what had happened with Martin in the latter seasons of Game of Thrones. In the early seasons, Martin wrote and read scripts, consulted on casting decisions and visited sets. Over time, however, as he stepped back to focus on his long-delayed next Thrones novel, The Winds of Winter, oh my god, they called it a Thrones novel. We'll just sail past that. Uh, Martin grew estranged from the show, which was created by D.B. Weiss and David Benioff. Uh, by seasons five and six, and certainly seven and eight, I was pretty much out of the loop, Martin said. Um, and this is a trend we've seen with Martin sort of steadily getting a little bit more clear or bold with sort of distancing himself from the last season. Uh, and when asked why, he said, I don't know, you have to ask Dave and Dan, um, who declined to comment. Uh, Martin said the winds of winter, which he conceded is very, very late, but vowed to finish, diverges from where Game of Thrones the series went. My ending will be very different, he said. Suck it, Danny haters, David Lightbringer added. Oh, wait, I put that in there. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I uh, couldn't help. But no, for real, and we're not going to beat the dead horse here, but every statement from Martin about the endings has just steadily gone like this more and more, so... Um, yeah, I mean, some of that might be reacting to what he saw on the screen, but mostly I think he was always going with a different direction, particularly with Danny. And again, I've talked about that at length, but I just want to throw that one out at you. So he had some interesting comments on House of the Dragon. Um, and look at me moving on quickly past that one. That, that's I'm, I'm maturing, guys. I'm growing up. All right, so George on, on the House of the Dragon rollout, it says, Martin does wonder if they will be viewers who skip House of the Dragon, the first Thrones spinoff, or successor show, as he likes to say. This series will make its much-anticipated debut on HBO and HBO Max on August 21st. People say, I'm done with Thrones. They burned me. I'm not even going to watch the show. And this is George Martin talking. I'm not going to watch any of the new shows, Martin said in a recent interview. And I do see those comments occasionally, too, of course running a YouTube channel about Game of Thrones. Uh, the question, he said, is how much of the Thrones audience do the complainers represent? This is really funny. I mean, are we talking about a million people, he asked, or are we talking about a thousand? People who have nothing to do except tweet all day over and over again. I don't know. <laughs> so that's that's kind of funny. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, I I think everybody wonders that sometimes about social media it's like we know it's a certain kind of person that's very online uh that that uh you know have an outsized opinion and, and after a while it starts to sound like most people think and talk very extremely and we kind of know that's not actually how real people are for the most part um so martin is sort of wondering about that same thing and then the last line says martin and hbo are about to find out and i will just say that um running the youtube channel here uh, most people are pretty enthusiastic, and a lot of the people that are like feel burned, which I feel very burned, obviously by the by the ending as we just discussed. Uh, most people have kind of separated that from the new show just because they're different showrunners. The process seems to be different. Obviously, Martin's more involved in this, um, so most people do seem to be willing to give it a chance. Especially the more I talk about it in this excited fashion that I have been since I saw episode one, which of course was very good, as I said. Um, so yeah, uh, again, sorry about the blinking. It's just, uh, that, that thing stings, man. I haven't gotten soap in my eye in a long time. It hurts in any case. So that was cool. Uh, we will see, I will say that, um, the show is going to be really good and I think it will be a pretty big hit. I'm not sure if it'll be exactly as big as Game of Thrones. Um, but it's, it's definitely going to be a pretty big hit. So, uh, and there's another note here. I'll just get through this real fast. Um, they are planning on doing the Martin Cinematic Universe, if you will, um, you know, spinning up the different shows. And it says, George, for us in this process, has been a really valuable resource. He's literally the creator of the world. He is its historian, its creator, its keeper. And so I don't imagine doing a show that he didn't believe in or didn't endorse. As for viewership totals, Blois said he did not expect House of the Dragon to match the heights of Game of Thrones, but he was still hopeful that it will be a hit and lay the groundwork for future spinoffs. There's no world in which we expect this to pick up from the, where the original left off. I think the show will do really well. But it will have to do the work on its own to bring people in and sustain the viewership. So that's good to hear, just because they don't have like unrealistic you know, expectations. Um, it's like, oh, well, if it doesn't do just as good as Game of Thrones, then it's, then it's a failure. Um, you know, I think it'll do really well. And it may do as well. 
And I think a lot of critics will review it and say that it's better. Um, but obviously there will be some fallout from people that got turned off. Uh, but, you know, if the show's happening and everybody's excited about it, I think that pretty much everyone will come back and check it out at some point. So I'm not really worried about that. I'm pretty optimistic. And all the House of the Dragon videos I've been putting out, everyone's excited about. And I think, you know, the book fans, who are the core of my original audience, um, you know, for us, it's just a chance to, it's something a little fresh. Like, obviously, George has taken a long time to write Winds of Winter. And so we've been talking about the same characters and the same parts of the story for a long time. Um, So, you know, it's just nice to have a little bit of freshness, some different folks, some different names to say, if nothing else. So, anyways, let's get into this dragon stuff here. Um, and I did want to talk about the Iron Throne real quick. Let me let me just, um, I got some pictures to talk about too. Uh, in fact, let me show you a few of these pictures real quick. There was a whole new trailer. I, I didn't, um, I put a lot of the footage in the uh, Damon's Ladies video, so I didn't feel the need to like sort of go through it. But there are like five or six pictures that are very conversation uh, provoking that I want to talk about. And that'll actually lead us into the uh, dragon morphology conversation. And Sean Downing with a super chat says, if there is a Grand Maester conspiracy, and they do look extra sinister, by the way, on the new show, they've got these weird, almost Frey-like hats. Like, if you remember the Freys from the first show, they had those weird caps. Um, the Maesters have, yeah, they look, they look sinister. Do you think we may see their order destroyed by the end of the Song of Ice and Fire? Okay, so you're talking about the books in general. The realm may need their medical knowledge. No, I think the Maesters will be ascendant at the end of the story as magic fades away. Uh, they will be needed. And, you know, we're, we're always talking about the Maesters as sin- you know, sinister and they're trying to kill the dragons. But if you lived in Westeros, you'd rather live in a country run by Maesters and, uh, you know, people like that than um, Dragon King tyrants, probably. So just putting that out there. It's not as fun for fantasy, but it's probably a better practical reality. Uh, So no, I don't think they'll be destroyed. In fact, I think Bran is the final king. We'll be partnered with Sam. Bran's going to have all that weirwood history in his brain, and he'll be like writing it down to give Westeros a better written history. I think that'll be part of the King Bran ending that was kind of missing on the show that'll help that make more sense. Because the weirwood net has the actual history of Westeros in it, going back thousands of years. So if you could put that in a book... That would help Westeros advance. They could come to terms with it, their own history, with magic, with everything that happens. So, um, yeah, I think that's part of the plan. So, uh, pictures, pictures, pictures. Yes, there's a few great ones. First of all, House of the Dragon. We haven't, uh, somebody on our Facebook group pointed out that House of the Dragon is a show that has a house for dragons. And that that's very nice, synergistic uh, yes, so it's literally the Dragon Pit is a house for dragons, and it's called House of the Dragon, so it's just very very on the nose there. And by the way, when I first looked at this in the trailer, I was thinking to myself, ah, it looks a little small. Maybe it's not big enough, but I don't think so. I think this is just one of those things where we're really far away, and as we get closer to it, it's going to be suitably huge, and there'll be plenty of room for dragons. And there's another picture of Rhaenyra down here, where she's standing outside the dragon pit. And you can see Cyrax right here. So this is, this is at the dragon pit. This is Cyrax going back into her little dragon, uh, her little, you know, nook or whatever. And in fact, honestly, the whole thing feels like um, a lot like How to Train Your Dragon, where the dragons are kept in the little kennels. Um, I have to think that both How to Train Your Dragon and A Song of Ice and Fire at this point are influencing each other back and forth, which I I should do a video about that one day. I'm a big fan of How to Train Your Dragon, or at least recently a fan of. Uh, Marvin Martin says, Tyranny of Wizardry for Tyranny of Academia. Yeah, I'd rather have Tyranny of Academia. Exactly. That one's probably easier to deal with. Um, And then there was another one. Uh, While we're still on Hot D Topics, will we get a Cregan Stark video? Um, probably like in between season one and two or two and three, like when he's set to come into the story more, he's not going to be a big season one character. So there's a lot of cool stuff in that's going to be on house of the dragon in later seasons that I haven't even touched yet, uh, because we're just trying to focus on what's going to be on season one, but will John become Azor high in his spinoff? Well, that's one of the directions they could go. 
the Azor High prophecy stuff was completely just swept aside on the show. So if they are going back for White Walker stuff, then yeah, you would go back for John Azor High stuff as well. That would be one of the few things that would probably make people interested in the show, to be honest. HBO, if you're listening, cough, cough. I could help you write it if you if you have to make this. Um, in any case, uh, so there you go. That is Cyrax in the background um, going into the dragon pit. And we'll probably come back to this picture later after we talk about the different kinds of dragon skulls, which is what we're here to talk about. I'm I'm holding off the big one. Uh, so just bear with me for a second here. These are, this is worth talking about too. So the Valerian knife, uh, I pointed out that these look like runes here, um, glyphs of some kind that maybe only show themselves in the fire, which is a little cooler than the Star Wars Goonies knife where they held it up and the edge of the knife showed them where in the ruins of the Death Star to find the thing with the thing. Uh, but this is, this is something having to do with heating up the steel. It's going to show some glyphs probably has to do with all that prophecy talk and stuff um this is not an episode one so i don't know i'm I'm speculating here uh but there somebody went to the museum display recently uh and they had some valerian glyphs on display and there was one or two of them that looked similar to what's on the knife the other ones are hard to recognize but it does seem like along with the valerian language that has been developed since the first show that will be they'll be using on this show a lot um, they also are doing glyphs that may have a, a coherent, unified thing to them. They're not just carvings. Um, so they're developing a glyph language for High Valerian. So that's pretty cool. I just had to show you that. Um, moving along, we'll, we'll see. We'll let the show develop that. There are these cool uh, carvings, uh, Targaryen carvings. They seem to show scenes of dragons and ships. So this would presumably be the migration of the Targaryens to Dragonstone. And we get one with a close-up. And you can see here it's somebody with a whip. And there's the dragon. And there's a ship. And then there's a mountain in the background. So pretty sure this will be landing on Dragonstone. Um, uh, Palella says, speaking of, do you have any questions for David Peterson about the glyphs? I can ask him. Um well, I would love to know anything there is to know about them. Like, um, you know, just what's the deal with them? Are they, like I said, is it, is it there? Is it really correlated to the language? And where did they draw the glyphs from? Are they using like Norse runes? And uh, mm, sorry, guys. Ooh, yeah, anything. I'd love to know anything about that. Um, I'm sure my audience would too. This is just the kind of show. That would love, and in fact, if he would ever love to do an interview or something, uh, you know, I'd be, I would love to interview him. So maybe that's the question: is would he like to come on a show and talk about High Valerian and the glyphs and working on the show? <laughs> That'd be sweet. In any case, yeah, the dragon face is a little human looking. It's definitely a little derpy drogon there. He's got a cheeky little grin, uh, so that is very cool. And um, by the way, I don't know if we're connected on social media. Let's see. What was your name? Scrolling back. Palella. Yeah, if you're on Insta or Twitter, uh, connect with me, Palella. I'm at the Dragon LML on Twitter, and I'm at David Lightbringer on Instagram. Oh, oh, you're the one who posted the runes on Twitter. Oh, okay. Very good. Uh, small world. It's all coming full circle. Very cool. So, yeah. Okay. So, we'll talk on Twitter then. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so the, the, the crowd is already fired up. Yeah, if we could if we could get that together, that would be sick. That would be really, really fun. I'm just the nerd he's looking for. Uh, so more more Valerian lore that we found here. Uh, this is Rhaenyra putting the egg into some sort of egg-shaped basket, wire basket uh, in the furnace or in front of the furnace. We've seen that the eggs need to be kept warm. Um, if the video is freezing, by the way, just hit the refresh button. It, it's it's good on my end, so I, I think it should be uh, should be okay. But let me know, by the way, if if everyone's having issues. Um, so yeah, there's something about the eggs need to be quickened, or they need to be kept warm, or something like that. Uh, so we've seen both the stew pot egg warmer, and we've seen now this basket in the fire. So we don't know what's going on, but that's pretty interesting. It's some sort of incubation or quickening or something like that. So, um, here we go. Next up will be Damon Targaryen, a uh, member of the Illuminati. <laughs> I don't know what else to call this. 
I think this is supposed to be like a fabulous pirate coat. So this is maybe when he's king of the Stepstones. Or maybe it's when Damon and Lena go to Essos on their tour. Maybe he's, you know, in Tyrosh or Pentos, you know, wearing some Pentoshi stuff. Or So I don't know. It's a pretty fab coat, but it it looks like it might have arcane symbols on there or something. I don't know. Um, it's it's very It's very... I'm in a secret cult library vibes here, which I love. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, here we go. Then we've got Young Rhaenyra on the dragon. I showed this in the last couple of videos. You've probably seen this, but I just want to show it again. It's a dragon saddle. And in this interview I'm about to read, they're going to talk about how uh, the different dragons have different uh, uh, style saddles. And Damon is more barbarian, look more Conan the barbarian looking. So Rhaenyra's is very princess looking. Ah, the costume designer said it's his Pentos outfit. Okay, so I was right then. Pentos. When in Pentos, do you like the Pentoshi? Very good. Um, and so here's more Damon fabulousness. Uh, this is obviously just a, more scenes from whatever fight that he's having that I've already seen that I can't talk about. But very cool. Uh, Damon energy here, holding Dark Sister up in challenge. You can sort of feel the energy of him stalking towards his opponent. So very cool. It's going to be a great scene. Y'all will see it soon. Like, what, nine days? It's crazy. Um, so then we've got this cool shot of the Iron Throne. Um, and there's a quote from George about the throne. He says, it's the kind of a throne that makes a statement. It says, look at my power. These are treasures of people I have killed or conquered. And this, this was a little interview clip with George from the last video. And basically, they were talking about how uh, Ryan Connell was talking about how he was trying to make a throne that is more in the spirit of what's in the books, but that still honors the throne that was on the show. So there's some continuity. And so that's how they got this sort of sword garden feel of the throne. Um, but the, and, and a couple of people have complained about it. Most people say it's better, at least. But I think the point is the theme that George is harping on here. The point of the throne is not only that it's dangerous and the king shouldn't rest easy, but it's very much a, a barbarian statement. Like, I, these are the swords of the people I have killed. It's very, it's very barbarian-like. And it goes along with the idea of the Targaryen dragon kings who are constantly, by simple presence of their dragons, threatening to go full Valeria, you know, full Magor the Cruel, full Field of Fire on anybody that doesn't bend the knee. Um, so it also makes it very difficult to approach the throne, which I think is cool. You can't just walk up to it. Um, and that's, that's more like to feel in the books too. So very cool. I just wanted to point that out. Um, now let's talk about, I've been meaning to talk about these for several videos and I keep forgetting these friggin' Gondorian statues in the Red Keep throne room. Um, I have to assume they would be the Targaryen monarchs who have reigned before Viserys, because Viserys is the fifth king, and there's four of these statues. So that would be Aegon, Aenys, Magor, and uh, what's that guy? Jaehaerys. So um, let's look at this. is probably the best shot of it here. And looks like they're holding shields and or swords in front of them. So again, it reminds me of the statues from Lord of the Rings, the Gondor statues. Um, and here's another shot. That one on the right, far right, looks like Jaehaerys. It's got the same crown that Viserys wears. And it's, it just looks like a Jaehaerys haircut, but it's hard to say. Um, but yeah, mad vibes in any case. I think it's way cool, um, and I hope they explain it. And some people have asked why the dragon skulls aren't in the Red Keep throne room. Well, only three dragons have died to this point. That's... Something that's going to be more feasible after the Dance of the Dragons. We'll have a lot more Dragon Skulls by the time the show is over. But at this point, it's only Meraxes, who was shot down in Dorne. Uh, Balerion, who died of old age. And Quicksilver, who was killed by Balerion. So there's only three skulls. And obviously, Balerion's skull is, you know, revered on some sort of altar, as we've seen a bunch of times. So this is a cool shot of the throne room. This is also... You can see like the King's Guard spread out in front of the throne. And here's Daemon Targaryen having some sort of confrontation with his brother. And you could just, it's a lot more intimidating now. You can see the thrones up on more steps, all the swords everywhere. Like, 
when someone sits on that throne, it's intimidating. And that's part of the effect of a throne. So a very cool moment from the trailer is this one to hear. Um, Viserys' mouth is saying the word queen. Um, and he's talking about, oh, a king has to, a Targaryen king's got to know this. It's a dangerous seat and responsibility, blah, 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 blah. And he says, a king's got to know that. And then he says, or a queen. And he turns and he says the word queen. And then Rhaenyra's like, ho what now? Say what? Did you say a queen? You could see the like, hmm? Um, and so this is something that they're kind of spoiling. So I'll tell you a little bit about this. Not too much. Don't worry. I won't spoil it. But as they're showing you, Rhaenyra is made the heir at an older age than in Fire and Blood. In Fire and the Blood, she's the heir from the age of five. But as you can see from this scene, Viserys is, is broaching the idea of making her a queen. And it's a new idea to Rhaenyra. She's like, huh, what? So... That's interesting. It changes her character a little bit. Um, it means that up to the age of 14, she never thought she was going to be queen. So she's more like a second child, you know, doesn't have all the pressure on her. And all of a sudden, that's going to change. And it's going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, you're the heir now. Damon's not. So, and we could have figured that out also because they haven't, they didn't cast a five-year-old Rhaenyra. So we knew that they were going to take some of the events that are spaced out and condense them around the age when Rainier is about 14 to 16 and there'll be an, you know, another chunk of events that'll get condensed around the age of adult Rhaenyra. So that's one thing that's a little bit of an interesting change. And I think it really works. Um, and, uh, yeah, you'll see the rest of it on episode one, but that's a big moment that they gave us in the trailer there. This is another one. Uh, this is not from episode one, so I don't know what the exact circumstances here. But Rhaenyra, wearing a smashing white dress, by the way, um, is turning around and saying, Father, you have dragons. Our family has dragons. And that's followed by two reaction shots. One of Viserys, Otto looking at Viserys, I should say, and then the rest of the small council all turning and looking at each other like, huh? What did she say? So I'm not sure what they're talking about. Um... And I'll check that PayPal in a second, Amanda. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure what they're talking about, but they're talking about some conflict. And Rhaenyra is like, well, you've got dragons. So why don't you use the dragons? So I could, would probably have to guess that this would be the Stepstones conflict they're talking about. Um, that's the only real conflict early on that we could be talking about. The war doesn't break out until much later when Rhaenyra is an adult. So this is probably Rhaenyra listening in on a small council and beginning to have a little input. And her input is like, hey, don't we have dragons? So, you know what I mean? Um, it just shows a little bit about Rhaenyra's... Because there's another clip where she's talking about not being a tyrant and this and that. Uh, but she does love her dragons as well. So they're showing you different sides of her. And yeah, there's definitely some entitlement with Rhaenyra. Um, that's big part of the character. And that's part of why I was trying to tell people, like, it's she's not whitewashed. Um, we are dealing with patriarchy, you know, which represses women and limits them to certain roles and stuff like that. We're certainly doing that, uh, but that's not the, the entire point of the show. And that doesn't mean that the female characters will be turned into these innocent victims and everything is done to them. That's not true. They're great characters, too. And yes, Rhaenyra obviously is a princess. There is a certain amount of entitlement uh, with all of this nobility. Um, so, yeah, but the, I'm going to get into some comments from the actors uh, in a minute, that gets into that topic. So we will come back to that in a second. Do you think young Rhaenyra and Allison will be involved in the show past season one? Probably not, unless they plan to do flashbacks. Maybe they could leave a couple mysteries hanging and then in later seasons do a flashback, but I doubt it. I think they'll be done once uh, once they're done. So, all right, um... And there's just a couple more pictures, and then I'll get into the dragon morphology stuff here. Uh, actually, no, that is it. Uh, the next pictures are just of dragons. So, shout out to Albert, who sent me this super high-res Corexes here. Very cool. And here's Rhaenyra's C-Rex. And, oh, I forgot to open the most important picture. Let me just find this real quick. Yeah. So here's what you came 
to see, folks. This is the reason why I'm doing this stream, really. Three types of dragon skulls, and they're based on the T-Rex, a wolf or dog, and a horse. And this was Sapochnik's idea um, to give the dragons different looks. And it's really, really cool. Everyone's been talking about it on Twitter. And so here I am to make sure everybody is in the loop on this, essentially, in case you had not heard. And I'll, I'll make this smaller so that I'm not, uh, the chat's not diminished here. Wait. Come back. Obey me. There we go. All right. Okay, so over the course of a calendar year with three meetings a week, five designers got to working on creating the looks of all the dragons. And this is Entertainment Weekly, by the way. I'm sorry, let me uh, give you the link. I've, this link is in the description, but I'll just drop this so you guys can check it out later. And yes, Caraxes is a good boy. We already started calling him a good boy, but you can see he is a wolfish dragon. That's why he looks to be grinning a little bit. So it kind of works. It's a very cool idea. I love this. Uh, spoiler alert. I, I like this. So, Five designers got to work on creating the looks of all the dragons for House of the Dragon, even beyond the first season. Each one often crafted concept art illustrations for two or three creatures at, a at the same time. According to Sapochnik, one artist would work on, look, work on the look for Cyrax, while another would work on Cyrax. Excuse me. Cyrax wins. While another, although Matt Damon... Matt Damon... <laughs> Oh, God, my brain. Matt Smith says Cyrax. Matt Damon says Cyrax. Uh, yes. Hey, Girl Nettles, what up? Oh, is Girl Nettles in the chat? I need to make her a mod. If she's... Oh, she is already a mod. Okay, great. So, <laughs> where were we? Cyrax, um, at, while another would work on Caraxes. Then, basically, they would switch and design them on top of each other's stuff, the showrunner notes. So, it was a collaborative process where they'd work on each other's dragons. So that's cool. It's not like the Dothraki, where no man rides another's horse. They were... Okay, so um, one presentation book consisting of all the designer's work contains approximately 900, if not 1,000 pieces of concept art. Sell it to me, please. Just for the dragons. So you can feel the love. You can feel the love for the dragons here. Um... <laughs> It's, it, and the actors, uh, Ryan Condal was already waxing poetic about this at Comic-Con. He went on for several minutes. It, it seemed like the most, the thing that he was the most excited uh, to work on. And in case you're tuning in late, I got soap in my eye right before the stream. And it is majorly hurting. And so that's why I'm rubbing it a little bit. So just pardon me. But yeah, Ryan Condal, super fired up to work about on the dragons. He's talking about how they all look different and they act different. And it was a major nerd nerd moment uh at comic-con and so there's a little follow-up here you can just tell i mean house of the dragon it's called house of the dragon it's gonna have cool dragons uh yeah and the 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 photo of Cyrax outside the dragon pit is cool yeah you can see that nice yellow color in the daylight um you know when it's all glittering in the firelight it could almost be any color right you know cgi enhanced or whatever uh, but this is a great daytime shot where you can really see how good they look. So, and they look awesome. I did rinse it out. No, I rinsed it. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I didn't rinse it enough. Maybe I need to rinse it more because it is still hurting. Or maybe I scratched it trying to rinse it out. I don't know, but it is definitely hurting. So don't worry about me. I'm good. We're gonna do this stream here. Zach De La Rocha can put on a whole rage tour with a broken ankle sitting down and still rock it. And you can look that up on YouTube, by the way. So I can definitely do this uh, with a watery eye. So yes, can't wait to see Sunfire, the most beautiful dragon in living in Westerosi history. Uh, yes, yes, Lady Starfall, thank you for asking. I will be doing live streams after the show every week. Um, and uh, I have um, uh, two co-hosts, Grayways Tim, and uh, Girl Nettles. And you could check out the three of us on the stream called... What was it called? We did a stream together a couple days ago. Girl Nettles, help me out. What was it called? I'm drawing a blank right now. I just cannot remember. Lime and salt water. Okay, I'll do that. Yes, thanks for the advice. <laughs> Alicia Kingston, you went to run the jewels and rage? That's awesome. They're not coming my way till March. So I will see them then. 
So the challenge was twofold, creating dragons that looked like they were in the same biological family as Drogon, Rhaegal, and Viserion, uh, yet not so similar that they all looked like their ancestral twins. It's one of the most satisfying processes because there was no limit placed on how we did it, Sapochnik says. A veteran of Game of Thrones who directed some of the originals, blah, 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 blah. I came up with the idea that there were three types of dragons, he explains. There's the dragons that are dinosaur-like. They have a big bridge on their nose. And I'll put that art back up real quick here. Dinosaur-like with a big bridge on their nose. There are the dragons that are canine, which usually have the convex feel to them. They are wolf-like. And then there's the dragons that are like horses, which are somewhere in between. And they actually, the horse ones look a little more snake-like, you guys will notice too, which kind of works. Um, so, uh, and so I've got a wolf skull, a horse skull, and a T-Rex skull, and designed the same dragon on top of them to see how the skull changed the features of the dragon. Very interesting. And thank you, Carsnark, for uh, dropping the link to the stream with uh, Grey Waste Tim and Girl Nettles. So, um, let's see, next up. Uh, you can see, so you can see that Danny's dragons are probably the T-Rex style. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I don't, probably the bigger ones I imagine might look like the T-Rex style. Um, just, I don't know. I, I guess not. We'll have to see. We'll have to see what Vagar, what style Vagar is. Vagar is freaking huge. So, and speaking of Vagar, this is the next really interesting thing. I called this part old rickety dragons. And I think this makes a lot of sense. This is probably the biggest thing where they are filling in information about the dragons that was not in any of the books that we are now to evaluate. So check this out. The biggest dragon viewers will meet, of course, is Vagar. She's like a cantankerous old lady, Sapochnik describes the Leviathan. And um, in Fire and Blood, she's called a hoary old bitch. And hoary means white with, um, white with frost or white with age old, snowy white, things like that. So, Vagar is an old dragon, looks old, feels old. Um, Sapochnik says, bits of her are falling off, like little pieces of scale and stuff, and getting her in the air is a nightmare. When she's up and running, she's like a B-52 bomber. She's stunning and a force to be reckoned with. Landing her is a nightmare. So, never thought about that, but it kind of makes sense. Um, and it's almost like, uh, almost like uh, real quick, Kelly, no, the shepherd will not be in season one, I do not think, unless they just want to set him up. But he's not really in the plot up to that point. Um, so yeah, this, this is interesting. They're almost, uh, well, let me read the rest of the quote, and then I'll give you my thoughts. Vagar is the prime example of how the showrunners thought about the life cycle of dragons. One of the most interesting things for me was trying to figure out dragon sizes and dragon anthropology, Sapochnik says. What we came up with is dragons never stop growing. At some point in their prime, they're this fully formed, incredible beast, and then they start to get essentially cancer. Bits of them break off, they start to become flaky, and they become so big that they break their legs when they land, and that's what kills them. What kills them is their own weight. Again, Sapochnik looked to dinosaurs when thinking about creatures that became so massive they could no longer sustain themselves. It's not just about the size of the dragon, he adds. It's about the state of the dragon. So that's really cool. Um, I know I have not seen concept art for Vagar. That's interesting. But so that's, that's cool because it makes it a little more of a fair fight. Because if it was just like, oh yeah, the dragon just gets bigger and more powerful to infinity. Well, it's like nobody would be able to mess with the big dragons. But it's like, oh, they're a little more cumbersome. And Fire and Blood does describe Vagar as taking more time to get aloft, not as nimble as the younger dragons. So, yeah. Um, I don't know how I feel about the bones breaking, because dragon bones are supposed to be high iron content or whatever, but maybe that's just, like, they're so heavy that even that could break the bones. Because obviously the bones can break. Like, a big dragon can crush a smaller dragon's neck with its jaws. Um, and it's implied that uh, Quicksilver died when it hit the ground after... <laughs> After Balerion the Black Dread tore her wing off, girl. That's what happened. So, um, guys, let me hit you with the music again. I'll try to wash out my eye a little better and grab Cleo. I'll be right back. And, uh, yeah, here we go.
Okay, that actually does feel a little better. Um, I think I may have had just a little bit of soap still in there. Yeah, it does feel better now, so thanks. Put a patch on the eye. Yeah, I'll put my squid shirt on and just go full year on. No, I'm good, I'm good. Um, so thanks for uh, being patient there, enjoying my funky remix of the Game of Thrones theme. So so that's cool. Decrepit old Vagar, different shaped uh, dragon skulls, right? That's all pretty interesting stuff. And yeah, if you're if you're a squisher, guys, if you've joined the squishers, then hit me. You got a Cleo emoji in your emoji set, so now is the time for the Cleo emojis. Rinse with soap and water. Thanks, downtown Clowny Brown. I appreciate that. I'll be sure not to listen to you next time I have a problem. So training and riding dragons. On top of three types of dragons, Sapochnik also makes distinctions between the domesticated and the wild, untamed dragons. Shout out sheep stealer. That roam Westeros. There are three wild dragons designed for the show that won't make appearances in season one, but remain the showrunner's favorite to date. Girl Nettles, did you hear that? Their favorite dragons are Sheep Stealer, Cannibal, and Grey Ghost. Some people were like, oh, are they even going to be in the show? Yes, they're going to be on the show. They're their favorite dragons. The wild dragons. So expect the, cl- the dragon seeds claiming the dragons stuff. That's going to be fully realized. And it's going to be awesome. Um, I didn't put soap in my eye on purpose. (laughs) That's enough. My eyes are fine. Enough talk about... Gosh, never say that you have a problem on a live stream. In any case, Cannibal is awesome. It's a huge black dragon, but with green eyes instead of red, like Balerion and Drogon. The Grey Ghost, Sheep Stealer. They are the, the favorite dragons of the show creators. That's awesome to hear. So... What we had to sit down and figure out, how do you train a dragon, Sapochnik says. You can watch the movie, which is really good. Like I said, it is. Uh, definitely inspired by Ice and Fire. How to Train Your Dragon is a great reference point. But how you train your dragon became all sorts of things, like how do they give them implants when they're little that then later become the hooks for the reins? That's cool. Um, so then they get little pricks to figure out uh, when they're first given to their rider. Uh to figure that out when they're first given to the writer. The writers are also kids who don't know how to deal with the dragon. And then as they grow older, they don't need the reins anymore, and the reins become extraneous. Uh, it's Nerd City, and I had more fun doing that. Um, and the saddles are probably something that you might not need uh, until the dragon was larger, too. If the dragon is, you know, smaller, you could pretty much just sit on it with the reins, maybe. But uh, with a larger dragon, you definitely need the saddle, so... Um, let's see. And they talked about how it's common pl- practice to place an egg in the cradle of newborn Targaryens. Of course, Reyna, writer of Dreamfire, started that tradition. It says a warehouse uh, housing the show's props uh, contains various multicolored dragon eggs created for House of the Dragon. Some are black, some are purple, some are pristine, and some have moss growing alongside the bottom. That's pretty cool. A few of the younger cast members spent about five days on a dragon pit set filming with actors playing high Valyrian speaking dragon handlers who teach Targaryen children how to bond with these creatures. So going back here, you can see in the background these people in the gray robes. There's three of them. This one guy's got a, a long stick and they kind of like nudge the dragon with the... It's literally like a 10-foot pole. Like, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Well, that's apparently... How you touch a dragon, you just encourage it to go this way. You, you gently prod it with a 10-foot pole. It's kind of kind of funny. I mean, it literally is about 10 feet, so yeah. Anyways, um, they do speak in High Valyrian to the dragons. The dragons, um, I don't know if they're supposed to be smart enough to speak High Valyrian, or it's more just like a dog or a parrot learning commands. Um, learning commands, Cleo. You're supposed to follow commands, by the way. Did you know that? You didn't know that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty cool. They speak to them in High Valyrian. And, of course, uh, also Damon and Rhaenyra speak to each other in High Valyrian quite a bit. So that's very cool. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so when Danny does the whole Dracarys thing, that's like a tiny little bit of what what it used to be like, kind of. So, um, let's see. We're in this big ditch. Uh, and there's a scene where I'm patting my dragon. This is Millie Alcock talking. But it was just a big blue cutout. And then there was a big blue screen behind it. Um, it just looked like we were really 
at a shitty music festival because it was this little lifted area that I would jump off. And I would, and I would have to pat the dragon. Then Miguel was like, can you smell it? I was smelling this styrofoam, but I got the incentive like, you smell your dog or cat. It's a very human thing to form a connection. So it's kind of, I thought that was an interesting moment because, of course, you know, one of the challenges for actors is not just acting, but like acting with the green screen props. Instead of the dragon, it's just a little tennis ball on a pole or something, you know, or uh, one of the guys holding the dragon head on a little stick, right? So you still have to conjure the emotion of being next to a dragon, which would be awe-inspiring and frightening. It's also your pet. So this is kind of just a little detail where Sapochnik's like telling, you know, Millie Alcock to think about smelling the dragon, just trying to make it more of a visceral experience. Uh, so it's just cool how much they're thinking about this and going into it. And there's another section I didn't clip where uh, Emily Carey, the actress that plays young Allison, uh, was talking about how they had this hour-long meeting with the whole cast just to talk about how people would act around dragons uh, and just to get that sort of outline. So lots of care and love for the dragons. And it says, according to Emma Darcy, dragons sparked an entire leather industry in Westeros, which they would. Unlike Game of Thrones, where dragons were extinct, House of the Dragon will see the production of saddles, each one distinct to the rider. A separate warehouse at Leavesden Studios contains these various seats constructed for each of the dragon riding characters. Damon's saddle for Caraxes is more Conan the Barbarian, with furs draped over the mount. Rhaenyra's saddle, by comparison, is more regal. And of course, I showed you that picture earlier. I'll flip it back up. There's Rhaenyra's saddle. We can't really get a good look at Caraxes' saddle. Um, we see the front of it with Caraxes, but not the back. So you can see the you can see how it's wrapped around him, um, but not really what it's like on the back there. All right, real quick, guys, let me check my PayPal. You can also submit questions via PayPal. That's particularly appreciated if you have a larger donation. Uh, Amanda Robinson says, um, do the dragons make the same sound as Drogon in episode one? Oh, man. I wish I had listened for that. I don't think it sounded like wildly different, and I don't think it would. But um, I, I would assume they would work on it, not just use the same sound. But I was, yeah, I was so blown away by the episode as a whole. Uh, the, I, I don't know. I, I think I missed stuff like that. Um, I'll have to watch for that. Yeah. There was only a little bit of dragon action. I will just say they did not like assault you with dragons in the first episode. There was, there was some, uh, but, but I think we're going to get more in the, in episode two or three, like that whole, um, that whole uh, confrontation with Damon and Otto, what the dragon's egg on the walkway at Dragonstone where the dragons fly over, that doesn't happen in the first episode. So we don't get anything quite, quite like that. Um, so, okay. This is really cool. Uh, it's very thought-provoking here. I wanted to include this. So this is um, the characters talking about what dragon riding means, or the actors talking about what dragon riding means to the various characters. So for Rhaenyra, dragon riding is a means to enjoy the freedoms usually afforded to men in this medieval time. And of course, that's obvious if you think about it. You know, um, the, uh, you know, women, you know, patriarchy, medieval, all that stuff. Women can't, you know, they don't have a lot of agency. But anyone who rides a dragon has a little more agency than the typical medieval woman. So that is very interesting. And that is what it means to Rhaenyra. So Emma Darcy says... It's an emblem of identity for her. Rhaenyra is humming with Targaryen fire. And what does it mean if fire is your ally? Fire is this volatile thing that's hard to control, that's hypnotic, that is beautiful, that is both an agent of terror and an agent of transmutation. It functions by destruction so that from the ashes something new can exist. And like how it's very metaphysical here from Emma Darcy, very, very alchemical uh, phrasing. And this is the kind of thing. I, We've been talking about A Song of Ice and Fire in these terms for years. The transformation effect of fire, creation through destruction, the creation that comes from chaos. I mean, these are some of my favorite topics that A Song of Ice and Fire has put us onto. So it's really cool to see Emma Darcy tuning into this stuff 
uh, you know, for the character of Rhaenyra. And Emma continues, that's where my area of reflection was. What is it to live with all that inside of you? When do you have to dampen that? And when do you learn to trust that? But it's hard to bring a fire into a council chamber. It's difficult. And so that we can see that conflict with Viserys and Damon. You know, Damon is looking at Viserys like, you lack the fire of a true dragon. And Viserys is looking at Damon like, you lack the patience to be a king and actually administrate a realm. And they're kind of both right. So that's why it's a shame that Sir Otto is there to drive a wedge between the two brothers. And if they could find a way to work together, then, you know, perhaps some of this could have been uh, prevented. But so great comments from Emma there. Very interesting. And uh, it's, yeah, it's just super spot on. Uh, Millie Alcock adds, uh, Rhaenyra is strong-minded. She's smart. I think she's underestimated. She realizes that women within the kingdom spend their entire lives serving to men. Oh, you need to be courted. So now I need to gain the attention of men to produce another man. She wrestles with it and she doesn't like it. She doesn't agree with it. And that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the thing with, uh, with the presence of, of these uh, pa- themes of patriarchy and repression of women in the show. Uh, it's, it's really simple. It's really just a huge, like some people are like, oh, well, it's overly political or whatever, but it's really just dealing with the human struggles that half of the population would have faced at that time. So to not deal with it would be weird. Um, so, I, you know, they're diving into it. And, and it's like, you know, guys, I would say, put yourself in the shoes, just like, like Millie's saying here. It's like, oh, in order to move up in society, you've got to get the attention of a high status man and then win him. And the entire end result of that is just to have more children, hopefully a son, so he can carry on the family name. And it's all very um, dehumanizing in a way. And you know, we're going to see that in episode one with the, with Viserys and Emma Arryn, who's had several miscarriages and is trying to produce a male heir for Viserys. So this is a big, a big topic of the show. And yeah, we'll, uh, there'll be more to say to that after we get a couple episodes out. But good comments from Millie there as well. And here's Eve Best, who, of course, plays Rainies, the queen who never was. And she says, dragon riding speaks to the wild part of Rhaenys, who was dubbed the queen who never was after she was passed over for the throne in favor of Viserys because of her gender. Connecting with the dragon is like connecting with everything about yourself and about life, about the world that is untamable, she says. It's intuitive and non-political, but it is animal and visceral. So that's really cool because Eve Best, I've already said that she, you know, the character that uh, she's playing feels a little bit like like a skilled political operator, like a Queen Olena, just a hint of Littlefinger, but without the overt, you know, sinister, pathetic evilness of, of Littlefinger, but just that skilled expertise watching everything. Um, but there's also this other side of Rainey's the Queen Who Never Was, even though she's older and she wears the, the fabulous dresses and, and has the big, big hairstyles and stuff. She is a dragon rider with a lot of fire in her belly. She commands a, a fierce dragon, and she will use that dragon in the war. So don't ever forget, just because she's a grandma, she's still a dragon rider. <laughs> she still packs a mean punch. So it's interesting. There's this very calculating political side of Rainey's that she's developed, but then there's also this more visceral and carnal side that identifies with the dragon. Because you would certainly say that Rainey's is a true dragon, in the spirit of Damon or Daenerys. And uh, Daenerys actually has a lot of parallels uh, to Rhaenys, even though the age is significantly different. Will Kristen Cole put them hands on Damon? Oh, yes. You know it. That they, they, they fight a few times. So, yeah, that's for sure. Um, let's see. One second here, guys. Oh, I'm looking for... The mute button. All right, so Patty Considine, who plays King Viserys. King Viserys is the rare Targaryen who doesn't ride dragons. He ro- once rode Balerion the Black Tread, the dragon that once bonded with Aegon the Conqueror. 
But now the beast's skull sits at an altar in King's Landing surrounded by candlelight. Viserys often visits his old friend when he's in deep thought. I just think Viserys has an understanding of dragons, Considine says. Um, he actually sees them as very, very dangerous and a huge responsibility. He understands fully that it's these dragons that make the Targaryens powerful. He also has an understanding of their potential to destroy the world. He sees them as nuclear bombs, in a way. I think Daemon would happily ride on dragons and torch everything, whereas Viserys is very much like, you have to behave responsibly with these creatures that we have, with these weapons, really. So, hashtag Team Small Folk. You know, it's a very responsible angle for a ruler to take. And I, I sort of highlighted that uh, a couple years ago. A couple years ago. I mean, a couple of uh, couple of days ago when I was talking about the difference in perspective with Viserys and Daemon. Um, Viserys is sitting on the throne, and he's got this Targaryen prophecy, whatever it is, about the end of the world. It's a lot of responsibility. You know, Daemon maybe isn't thinking about that prophecy, and he's not sitting on the throne. So... He's, he's at liberty to be more of a loose cannon. And we're going to see Rhaenyra go from one position to the other. She starts off not the heir. You know, Daemon's the heir, <clears throat> and Viserys is trying to have a son so that he can ha make him the heir. So Rhaenyra's out of the picture, um, and she's very much a loose cannon. But then all of a sudden, she's made the heir, and now she's got to be like, oh gosh, well, what is that actually going to be like? And think about sitting on the throne. So that's going to be cool. Uh, the, no, the rift between Cole and Rhaenyra, that's not going to happen right at first. At first, they've got to become close before they can rift. So, yeah. Yes, heavy is the head that wears the crown. That's exactly right. Here's a, Matt, here's a great Matt Smith quote. Um, Damon has a great affiliation and love and admiration for his brother, the king. But Damon's all swords and knives, really. I do think on some level he wants to cause chaos. I think he's interested in chaos. I think he survives in chaos quite well. He's got a very qu quite clear moral compass, and you're either in it or out of it. So this is a very interesting turn of phrase that Matt Smith has given us, Matt Damon as he's known. Um, a moral compass is supposed to be a direction-finding device, right? It's supposed to be like, I have a moral compass, which means I have an abstract sense of morality, that I will then apply to situations that will guide me how to navigate the situations. But Matt Smith, in totally having absorbed the character of Damon, speaks of the moral compass as a circle that you're either in or out of. So it means that Damon's morality is loyalty. That's what it means. He's like, family, I'll do anything for my family. I'll send assassins to murder children for my family. I'll do, I'll burn people alive. I'll kill people. I'll do whatever. Um, but uh, if you're in my loyalty circle, then I'm going to ride for you to the death. So that's kind of Damon. It's certain people have that mentality in life. That's Damon's mentality. Uh, it's very well expressed by Matt Smith there. So it's cool that he gets the character that well. Um, and of course, that quote, there's a quote from one of the new trailers where it's, it's Matt Smith talk or it's Damon Targaryen talking, I should say. And he says, we will restore the Targaryen dynasty to its proper glory. That, to me, sounds like a quote from an older Daemon, probably after he's married Rhaenyra, and they are determined to not let the throne pass to those nasty greens, the high towers, and all their ilk. And, you know, they're talking about what the Targaryen dynasty really means. So Daemon's taking it a little more seriously, it sounds like, is my point. By, the, by later on in the story. And that's an interesting character arc to go through. So, um, about chaos. So Peter Baelish very famously says, chaos is a ladder. Okay. He's approaching chaos differently than uh, Damon is. What, what Peter Baelish is talking about is causing, is more like Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, if you're familiar with that, where in chaos he can essentially get away with more evil shit. He can murder people. He can steal an heir or princess. He can frame people for murder. He can get away with stuff in chaos because he is a nefarious operator who's using chaos as a cloak to do bad things. Damon thrives in chaos. That is different. What that means is that Damon, Damon doesn't have these long-held plans that he springs into action during chaos 
he is like a jazz musician in the chaos. He is like, let's throw everything up in the air and <clears throat> just see what happens. And I'll be able to react to it better than other people will. So it's more like enjoying that lack of order. You could almost say like Damon is a little bit like me, a little bit like an ADHD person, any sort of confinement. And he just pushes against it by instinct, just chafes it against it by instinct. That's always how I've been. I'm not a follower, not a joiner, you know, start my own stuff. So that's that's me. And uh, that's Damon, too. So I resonate with that. I think that's what I like about Damon the most. So, yeah, that's that's all I've got for notes, guys. Um, that was three different interviews and a bunch of new pictures. So I will take questions for a few minutes if you guys have some questions about the dragons. And I will rack my brain to see if there's any thoughts that I didn't get to. Uh, but that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. Just the love for the dragons that's going on, the different types of dragon skulls, the different looks about them. Like It's one of the things that people asked about the most. Will the dragons be colorful? Will they look different? Will they have different personalities? It's like, yes to all of that. There's a new video of Caraxes on Twitter. That's cool. See, that's what you can't even do a live stream these days without something new coming out. It's, uh, it's all over the place. Let me see if I can maybe grab it real quick. Be quick on the punch here. Let's see if Caraxes is trending or somebody already tagged me. People have been tagging me more and more. Um, oh, you're talking about the Times Square video. Okay, yeah. So there's there's one of um, uh, there's a there's a huge billboard in Times Square. It's like a 3D looking thing, and it's got Caraxes uh, breaking through the wall and roaring and spitting fire. It's pretty cool. You can definitely find that on Twitter. Um, Miguel said in an interview today that Caraxes is deformed, comparing him to the Elephant Man, and needs his leg wings to fly because he's too long. Uh, that's interesting. That's from Agramem uh, Agramemion. Um, so deformed, like always, oh, because he is very long. I noticed that Caraxes is very worm-like, and of course his nickname is the Blood Worm. So that's a good bit of inspiration. They took Caraxes' nickname and sort of assumed what he might look like. They came up with a wormy thing. And you notice that Caraxes does have those cool little smaller wings on his rear legs. Um, and he uses those to fly. So that's cool. He's too long and he needs the rear wings to fly. So it's a little bit of a e different evolutionary design. Uh, that's cool. I dig it. Um... And I'm just scrolling up. Will the dragon smoke match the color on their scales? That's the one thing we don't know is will the dragon fire be different colors from all the dragons? We do not know that yet. I cannot answer that. Um, who's DJP, Palella? I'm really bad with remembering stuff like that who is djp is that the the linguist person or <clears throat> all right so yeah in case you missed it guys just to let you know what's going on starting monday i'm doing seven videos in seven days to get ready for house of the dragon very exciting david peterson okay right um and uh i will this sunday i will be doing a sunday stream it is much awaited the Blame Game with Tony Teflon. I talked about it a bunch a few weeks ago <clears throat> and then got tied up with a bunch of things. I went to Australia. Blotty, blotty, blotty. But <clears throat> Tony is going to honor us with his presence this Sunday. It'll be the Blame Game. And we're going to go through all the characters and throw a whole bunch of shit at the wall and talk about who's at fault for all this stuff. It'll probably be a little bit contentious. Me and Tony always disagree about something. Uh, but of course we have a lot of mutual respect as well. So it'll be a friendly disagreement. Um, and yeah, it'll be, it'll be good. The chat will be hopping. And of course, if you don't know the Don Tony Teflon, check out his channel, Tony Teflon TV. I think it's actually just Teflon TV, but any combination of those words in YouTube will bring it up. He's been doing it for longer than I have folks. He's been in the game forever, forever. <clears throat> so it'll be fun to talk to him. And uh, if you need an adult dating site, there is one right there. Hit it up. I'm sure it's got high quality nudes and adult content. Ha <laughs> ha. 
uh, I don't know what to say anymore with these with these things. I don't know what they think they're getting, but yeah, there's the link for Teflon TV. Thank you, Carl. Uh, yeah, Caraxes does look a little smog like. He almost looks like he's wants to talk wants to talk and and do some riddles or maybe just eat you. But yeah, I dig that. Yeah, no, Vagar is still going to be the old and most powerful dragon. It's just that like she's lumbering. She is 180 years old. Um, and yeah, falling apart a little bit. I don't know. I dig it. I think it's cool. She'll still have the hottest fires and be the hardest to kill. So it's not going to change that, but it's like, I mean, if you think about it, there has to be an explanation for how anybody could match Vagar. You know, I don't want to spoil the dragon fights in the show, but Will I have a seven-pointed star carved in my forehead for each of the seven videos in seven days? No, Girl Nettles, I'm not a religious fanatic. Just say no to fundamentalism. <laughs> so, like I said, last, last call for comments or questions if you have any questions you want to slip in here at the end. So yes, Caraxes will be the fiery direwolf for Damon. Caraxes is going to be a fan favorite. I think that's pretty obvious. Yeah, the old dragon's cool. I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. Hey, what's up, Destiny? Cool. Everybody's enjoying the videos? Yep. Thanks for all the great comments. Been watching the videos. Uh, numbers are doing great lately. Channel's growing fast. So that's very cool. Yes, please do leave a comment after the stream is over. That would be awesome. Will Grey Ghost and Cannibal get a better deal than in the books? Possibly so, Marvin. That's a great question. Um, the fact that they talked about the three wild dragons as their favorite means that they might do a little more with them. Uh, that would make sense. Oh, I missed a super chat. Let me go back and see if I can find it. Damon is a POS. I prefer Aryan Bright Flame to him. Oh, wow. That's a hard take. I mean, Aryan Bright Flame is definitely a POS. I mean, Damon is... You definitely can't... Uh, he's He goes beyond morally questionable at times, I will say that, yeah. But Aryan Bright Flame is... I don't know, you can't really defend him either, so I'm not sure. But uh, thank you for the super chat there. Will we see Mushroom get high? Um, are we talking like Alice in Wonderland? Like sitting on a, sitting on a mushroom, sitting on a mushroom with a pipe? I'm not sure, uh, but there have been rumors flying around about the casting. There is going to be a mushroom, it does seem like, but it might be a little different than what we are thinking. Because, of course, we get Mushroom's perspective and all his stories from his book, but in the show, he would just be someone in the background making jokes once in a while. So it does seem that Mushroom is going to be on the show. And that's another one of those ones that gets asked a lot for sure. What's a mushroom? Mushroom is a court fool that is one of the sources for these events. The book Fire and Blood is written as an unreliable narrator book. It's like an in-world history book, so it's a combination of the records of the maesters and a septon or two and also the court fool mushroom. But mushroom's account of everything is super bawdy and has all this perverted shit. Uh, shoved in every version of every story. So there's a compiling maester who's like, well, Mushroom says this, but the other sources say that, and we're just really not sure. So he's a fan favorite because he's always giving you the dirty version of everything. So he's going to be in the show, at least to some extent. He has a minor role in a couple of scenes. He's Rhaenyra's fool, essentially. So he hangs out with Rhaenyra mostly. Do you think we'll see what the last dragon looked like one day? Yeah, perhaps. That would be an interesting way to end the show, if you think about it. So, yeah, Mushroom is a TMZ of Westeros. Exactly. Exactly, Karstark. Cool, guys. Well, thank you very much. This has been a... Um... Ooh, there's a tiny shot of the opening credits that somebody has posted. I'm not sure. Oh, it's a fan concept. Ah, we've been had. Yeah, White's King. 
So not not nobody has seen. I got excited for a minute. Of course, we're all all waiting to see the opening credits and the theme music. Uh, not yet, not yet. It would appear. And by the way, um, Costume Co. You can follow their YouTube channel. Uh, it's called Costume Co. She will be a guest on one of our post game shows, and I will be a guest on her channel. Um, you should follow her on Twitter. She does cool stuff like this where she's identifying the fabrics that they're using or that look like the stuff on the show. So if you do cosplay or anything like that, or if you're interested in the textures and stuff, definitely check out Costume Co.'s website and, uh, and uh, Twitter. Uh, it's good stuff all the time from them. And look forward to having them on as a guest. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up there, guys. Thanks for joining me been a beautiful audience i will see you again sunday at three pacific time we will discuss well who's at fault like i said it's going to be the blame game with tony teflon and then on monday the day after that we'll begin seven videos in seven days hopefully i'll be able to pull that off without having a heart attack i think i'll be able to do it all right guys so thanks a lot i will see you again soon bye for now